Those golden days are vanished, and ordered is the scene. The diggings are deserted, the camping grounds are green. The flaunting flag of progress is in the west unfurled. The mighty bush with iron rails is tethered to the world. The poet Henry Lawson wasn't too pleased to see railways tethering his beloved bush, but most Australians welcomed them with open arms. The coming of trains signalled an end to social and economic isolation and the beginning of a farming revolution. If the future of rail lies with long hauls and mainline routes, much of its past lay with tracks just like this one. They were never major rail corridors, they were called pioneer lines. And for many outback towns, they were the first reliable link with the outside world. Down pioneer lines flowed the wealth of a nation, from farm, forest and mine from remote communities that would never have existed without their railway and could never have prospered without their trains. Australia prospered too as the Iron Horse brought an ever-increasing range and tonnage of primary products down to the sea. Exports boomed. In every Australian state, pioneer lines rather than intercapital city links were the government railway's first objective. Tracks that reached out both to open up the hinterland and to tap its wealth. Finally, pioneer lines alone would comprise a remarkable 20,000 kilometres of track. It seemed there was almost nowhere worth settling that railways couldn't reach. Today, those same pioneer lines are vanishing. Changing times have seen many railways outlive their purpose, although happily there are exceptions to every rule. To train buffs, it's an original NA-class side tank loco of the early 1900s. To everyone else, it's Puffing Billy, both Australia's best-loved little train and most successful example of a preserved steam railway, run by enthusiasts. One of Puffing Billy's achievements was to help to prove that a pioneer line didn't need to be far from town to be useful. Before the line was built, the Dandenong Ranges, just 40 kilometres from Melbourne, were still only sparsely settled. Puffing Billy changed all that. Today, proximity to the Melbourne tourist market is one of the little train's major assets. To arrive at Belgrave Station is to step back in time to somewhere around the 1920s. That's precisely the intention. Puffing Billy preserves the heyday of the pioneer lines. It does the job so well that it's hard to believe that the station itself is a replica. And that all the station staff are volunteers. In fact, the volunteers are vital to Puffing Billy's survival. 
When they took this railway over from the government in the mid-1950s, it had never shown a profit. And for all its obvious popularity now, without its unpaid helpers, this very successful tourist railway would still lose a million dollars a year. Billy is a narrow gauge railway with a track width of only two foot six. One of four such lines built by Victoria in similar rugged country. They were narrow gauge simply because the government of the day was too short of funds to build anything else. Because of its narrow gauge, Puffing Billy was never designed to travel at more than 20 miles an hour. But in 1900, even a slow train seemed very efficient and staggeringly fast compared to the alternative. Today, it's hard to imagine the impact of railways on country that had never known any kind of freight transport apart from the horse and dray and the bullock team. The horse and dray managed about five kilometers an hour. Bullocks were even slower. In bad weather, inland transport sometimes couldn't move at all. A few outback townships did already exist, but most were struggling to survive. With the coming of railways, those towns saw rapid change. With trains, a journey to town that had once taken weeks now took only hours. Most of the amenities of life were now available by rail. Everything from food and fashions to farm supplies. Farm supplies were most important of all, from seeds and tools to heavy machines to work the land. In the wake of railway expansion, rural Australia grew and diversified as it could never have done before. The towns themselves became more substantial. The makeshift shanties of pre-railway days gave way to much finer buildings. Bricks and timber, roof iron and plumbing, everything from nails to door knockers came in by train. streets in rural Australia began to express a new confidence in the future. Once a town was on the railway map, it believed it was there to stay. From time to time, and mainly for old time's sake, Puffing Billy mounts a replica of the kind of mixed goods train that once ran through these ranges every day. Yeah. 
Ian Barkler first drove Puffing Billy back when this was still a government railway. These days he comes back to drive as a volunteer, a kind of engineman's holiday. Having driven the train in its revenue earning days, Ian clearly remembers the kind of freight it carried into the hills. Well, in the very early days, the, the train would have been carting produce for various towns along the line and for the developing, developing towns and, and the adjoining areas, uh, farm, farm products and produce, uh, um, particularly uh, foodstuffs and, and that, that, uh, all that, that type of thing, and um, um, of course uh, structural timbers for, for, for building, and this type of thing. Uh, there was also a, a fairly good livestock traffic too in, in the early days and that, that kept up pretty well right through the, through the years. It was characteristic of all pioneer lines that timetables were less important than the personal service they brought to people along the track. They relied on the train and, and it, was, it was one of those things, well even if, uh, if at times people wanted mail taken, um, it was nothing for, for us to, to stop and pick up mail and, and uh, do little jobs like that for people, you know, they may want a, something bought in, in, at the railhead and, and no, no trouble at all, the, the crews would fit in well on the guards and it was a really close cooperation. One of the things Puffing Billy brought into the bush was a human touch. But no less important in economic terms was what it took out. Not just in the Dandenongs, but everywhere in Australia, advancing pioneer lines let new kinds of farming reach far beyond the cities. Pastures, dairies, orchards. If the land was fertile, the farms could be located anywhere railways ran. Puffing Billy achieved that on a minor scale, but the most striking example of all was in the great wheat belts of Australia's east and west. Across thousands of kilometres of wheatlands, the tiny grain silo towns are still often no more than 10 kilometres apart. They are the legacy of a different age, when the only way to get wheat out was to lay tracks almost to the farmer's door. In fact, the first settlers often moved into wheat country just one step ahead of the advancing track. They planted their first crop knowing that by the time it was ripe, the railway would have reached their farm. A vast new wheat belt that could never have been pioneered without its trains gave generations of small farmers a start in life. In return, the railways gained a major new freight and Australia gained a valuable new export, one that has helped to feed the world for a hundred years. Now and then, the search for new land could take even the railways a field too far. That happened in South Australia, where the advancing track encouraged wheat farmers to take up land in the Flinders Ranges. A few freak wet seasons had made this unsettled land north of Adelaide seem much better than it really was. But the country was marginal at best. Drought and fragile soil soon pushed wheat farmers out. One survivor from those early days, a remarkable little train that has never left the ranges. It's aptly named the Coffee Pot. It was a local commuter train linking the villages of the Flinders Ranges. 
Like Puffing Billy, the coffee pot only runs today because this train too was rescued by enthusiasts. It's a mark of South Australia's affection for its pioneer railways that volunteers were prepared to spend no less than 8,000 hours bringing the coffee pot back to life. Railways were soon pushing even beyond the limits of settlement. In the quest to reach timber camps and mine sites, tracks were laid where no road had ever been. Tracks that were often the only link with the outside world. Cairns in far north Queensland was the starting point for just such a pioneer line. This tropical port is surrounded by rugged tablelands. Tin mining started inland from here well before the railway came. The only link with Cairns was a tortuous pack horse trail across the mountains. In the big rains of 1882, mining towns just 50 kilometres west of Cairns were so completely cut off they suffered a famine. Something had to be done, and in 1887, Queensland Railways began to lay a remarkable stretch of track to link Cairns with the hinterland. It's not really far from Cairns to Garanda Station, up on the Tablelands, but the climb is spectacular. So much so that hundreds of tourists travel on the railway every day. That popularity gives this particular train a unique distinction. It's the only passenger train in Queensland that shows a profit. Building the line was one of the greatest challenges Australian railways would ever face. Carving a railway where there was not even a track, just dense jungle and sheer cliffs. It took four years of hard labour to get the first train up the range in 1890. It travelled, as it still does, around 98 curves, across two and a half kilometres of bridges and through no less than 15 tunnels. The price of building this line was high in every sense. 23 workers killed, hundreds injured, and a final bill for 300,000 pounds. Settlers soon followed their new train up the mountains. Farms that began as clearings in a rainforest soon became a rich new agricultural district, the Atherton Tablelands. Dairying, 
cattle and crops all flourish in the tablelands rich volcanic soils. About one hour out of Cairns, the train reaches Coranda. It's a lush rainforest setting. In fact, Coranda is Australia's northernmost railway station. This is as far as most tourists come. The railway itself continues much further west. This line still is a government railway. So far, Queensland has been reluctant to close its pioneer lines. But the truth is that there's not really enough business out here to pay the way. The train keeps running, largely thanks to a pact of honour between a government who built the line for a different age and the descendants of the pioneers who followed its track out west. If there's an ultimate example of the way Queensland has kept that pact, then it's this train. It's called the Gulflander, a train that has been disparagingly said to run between nowhere and nowhere much. It links the river port of Normanton with the old gold rush town of Croydon and connects with no other line. When the track was laid, Croydon was a booming gold rush town. The train even stopped at outer suburbs. On today's values, Croydon's reefs produced half a billion dollars worth of gold. But by 1920, most of the gold was gone. At the height of the rush, 6,000 people lived in the town. Today, the entire population of Croydon Shire is less than 400. As the town declined, there was talk of closing the railway. Indeed, it was first suggested as far back as 1911. Somehow, the Gulflander survived, and today its future seems reasonably safe. Even overseas tourists are drawn here to experience one of the world's last true outback train rides. Ride on the Gulflander is a friendly social occasion, and no one enjoys that more than driver Col Shepherd. The, the beauty of it is, it's you're there with the people are, are sitting right next to you, and they come and talk to you and ask you different things as you're going along, and it's a, it's sort of the, the next step from the steam engine. For mine, you know, you can hear the, the engine noise right next to you, and it, when it comes under load and goes off load, and yeah, it's the uh, clickety clack of the wheels and the bangs and kicks with it go along with it. This way, will you? Whoa. Go back behind the joint. There, hit him bush. Good one. The Gulflander was lucky enough to become an institution. Today, it's an exception that proves a rule. Just to keep this one quaint old railway motor running, the track needs constant attention. It's the cost of regular maintenance that has forced so many pioneer lines to close. The Gulflanders track is just 150 kilometres long. In total, Australia's pioneer lines once spanned no less than 20,000 kilometres. With declining use, the cost of upgrading all these lines is a price Australia really can't afford.
In an age before motor vehicles, railways were seen as the replacement for roads. As rails advanced, it was thought the road would never be needed again. In fact, when the first cars appeared, they had to battle with country roads that had been neglected for 50 years. Today, the story has come full circle. Trucks take an increasing share of country freight. Many of the old pioneer lines are closing down. Government operators say it's not a wholesale retreat, as much as a strategic withdrawal. Even so, it does mean that in much of rural Australia today, it's still easy to find a station. But you might wait the rest of your life to catch the train.